Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Uh, we we'll continue with the Necron Index today. Um, we're going to do heavy support. There's quite a few choices here. Um, it's about six, so there's a few to get through. Some really interesting ones. Uh, some ones that weren't very good in the last edition, some that were very good, so it'd be interesting to see what they're like now. Um, just to um, cover off what we did last time, just in case you haven't seen it, we did uh, Fast Attack and Flyers. Uh, we found that the Doom Scythe and Night Scythe are still awesome. Um, they've gone up in points, but they're both still completely worth their points. found that Canoptic Wraiths are still very good, but I think they've taken a slight hit in this edition. They're not quite the auto-take they were in the last edition. I think you'll still see them a lot, but they're not quite that. Uh, Scarabs are a lot cheaper. They're not as good, but they're a lot cheaper. So they've kind of become the horde swarm that they always maybe should have been a little bit. Uh, destroyers are a lot better. Um, and Tomb Blades are as good as they were, but they're a lot more expensive now. So they were the only ones that I think have been hit hard in this edition. The uh, Tomb Blades are very expensive now. So, um, on to the heavy sports. We've got Heavy Destroyers first. Um, so, Movement 10, Weapon Skill, Blister Skill 3+, plus, Strength 4, Toughness 5, 3 Wounds, 2 Attacks, Leadership 10 and a 3 plus save. So pretty good stat line, um, pretty tough to kill. Um, you can tell they're not amazing in combat, so got good firepower and good movement and pretty tough. So they'll be good in firefights, but once you get into combat, they're not going to really do much for you at all. Their heavy gauze cannon is 36 inches, heavy 1, strength 9, AP minus 4, D6 wounds. So it's really, really quite good. Um, it's basically uh, a last cannon for all intents and purposes. Um, you hit on 3+, plus, so it's pretty reliable, um, especially if you have a unit of 3 or 4 of these, obviously um, you can have a unit of up to 3, um, you're averaging 2 hits, so you should do some damage. They have reanimation protocols, hardwired hatred, so they can reroll hit rolls of 1 for the unit, so that makes them even more reliable because you only have got 1 shot each, um, you're actually averaging that all 3 should hit now. So, because the 50 is chance, obviously you roll a 1 if you're not going to hit. So you should you should be hitting with all 3 averagely. Well, 50%. <coughs> Repulsor platform. This unit can move and fire heavy weapons without suffering the penalty to hit. So they also don't get the minus 1 hitting for moving, so they can use that 10 inch move. So all in all, uh, a nice, manoeuvrable, tough fire base. But I believe they're reasonably expensive. So... Uh, they're 43 points each, but which is fine, but the weapon is 32. So they're actually 75 points each. So they are expensive. Obviously, three of these guys, therefore, is going to set you back with 225, I think, if my maths are correct. So obviously, that is that is quite a lot. They can fly as well. So they have the fly keyword, which is quite vital. Big, big advantage there. So yeah, I think they're I think they're a, about pointed right. They're hard to kill, so you are going to get quite a few volleys off in there. The volleys are devastating, but at the same time, they are expensive. Two hundred twenty-five points is is quite a lot. So they're definitely better than they were, and they're definitely worth looking at, but not not a vital unit for every game. Canoptic spiders. So you six inch move, weapon skill, blitz skill four plus, so not particularly skilled. Strength and toughness six is good though. Wep wounds for attacks for leadership ten and a three plus save. You can have uh, up to three spiders in a unit. And they're equipped with automaton claws, which are a melee weapon, strength the user, which is six, so it's pretty good. Minus two AP and D3 wounds. Um, so that's D3 damage, sorry, so that's pretty good. Um, they can be given a particle beamer which is 24 inches, Assault 3, Strength 6, AP dash damage 1. I suppose if there's 3 of them, that's 9 shots, but you are hitting on 4s, so shooting weapons maybe not their best thing. They can be given a Fabricator Claw Array. At the end of your movement phase, a model equipped with a Fabricator Claw Array can repair a single vehicle within 1 inch. It regains D3 wounds. <coughs> a model can only be repaired once per turn. Very good, depending on how expensive it is, because D3 wounds is pretty good considering most vehicles in this army have living metal, so they're already getting wounds back. So, to, I mean, so you could say it's overkill, but at the same time, if there's a V6 
vehicle that's really important to your army. That that's pretty nice. D3 wounds back. Gloom prison. A, a model with a gloom prison can attempt to deny one psychic power each phase. So it's pretty it's pretty good actually because although you're quite unlikely to deny in in some ways you're not getting any bonuses or anything like that. But obviously um it says model, not unit, so in theory I'm presuming you could have mobile units and just obviously uh, keep trying to deny. Necrons also don't have any psychic characters or real psychic presence, so having the option to deny rather than just accepting every power your opponent does is quite nice. And then we've got Scarab Hive. So at the beginning of the turn you can roll D6 for each um, Canoptic Scarab unit that is below its starting number of models within 6 inches of the spiders. On a 1 they suffer D3 mortal wounds, so that's quite nasty. They suffer potentially enough to nearly kill them now. But on 2 plus one of the spiders unit unleashes reinforcements and you return a swarm to the unit. So they can't produce new units anymore, They, but they can boost uh, spiders up. Uh, sorry, uh, Scarab swarms up, so that's pretty good. So how expensive are these guys? So Canoptic Spiders are 76 points. So at 76 points, you'll just have the Automating Claws for a bit of combat ability and the Scarab Hive. So the only reason you take them really um, is because you take Scarabs and you want to keep them going. Because um, after that, there's things to better spend your points on. But if you want to have the Gloom Prism to give you some anti-psychic power, it's five points, so it's nice and cheap. And the Fabricator Chloray, if you want to repair some vehicles, is eight points. So potentially they could have both of those and it would only be another 13 points which would put them on 90 points. So it's, not, it's, it's actually not crazy to have them for 90 points. And then they can keep your scarabs alive, keep your vehicles alive, deny psychic powers and they're not terrible in combat. So I quite like the idea with Canoptic Spiders that if you're going to take them you might as well beef them up with everything rather than just take them basic for 14 less points. And they are quite useful. Um, if you've got two spiders in your army and you've got two units of uh, scarabs and one can stay with each one and then one can maybe follow a monolith around or something like that. I mean with him um, bringing back D3 wounds a turn, your monolith, because he's already got living metal, is nearly unkillable. Um, it's going to be around for a long time and they could all deny psychic powers, all three of them. So you've also got three denies there which would be quite nice. Obviously three of them are quite expensive, that is you know, nearly 300 points, but still, um, it's, it's certainly an option. Certainly tempted to take one, just so I get the deny of the psych power. It doesn't give a range, so you can also deny it. So that's cool. So we're on to the monolith now. Obviously one of the iconic units, the Necrons. Incredibly cool model, um, st stood the test of time. Quintessentially Necron background-wise, but obviously it's not been great in the last few editions. So, big moment for the monolith. The monolith is 381 points. Obviously, it sounds an insane amount of points, but it's obviously got a lot of wounds now. So, going through its stat line, it's weapon skill 6 plus, strength and toughness 8, so hard to kill even with heavy weapons, 20 wounds, 3 attacks, leadership 10, 3 plus save. Uh, it goes down in remaining wounds, the movement goes 6, 5, 4, ballistic skill goes 4, 5, 6, and the portal of exile goes 4, 5, 6. <coughs> So it doesn't actually minus the amount of shots you get, which is quite good. So you've got the Gauze Flux Arcs. So there's four of those, um, each one on a corner. 24 inches, heavy three, strength five, AP minus two, damage one. So sort of as they were, really. They're okay. Um, they're not going to blow anyone away, but it's a nice bit of extra firepower, especially as now you can deep strike and not scatter, so you can land right in the middle of the enemy army and all four of them might get to fire. At different targets, so it's, it's not too bad. They've got the particle whip, which is 24 inches, heavy 6, strength 8, minus 2 AP, and damage D3. That's improved since before. The 6 shots, considering it's not D6, it is 6 shots, is better than the pipe plate, and the D3 damage is nice, so that's really good. It's got living metal, so it's really hard to kill. Uh, it can deep strike as long as it's 12 inches from enemy models without scattering. Portal of Exile, when an enemy unit other than a vehicle or monster charges this model, 
its port might, might activate on a D, raw D6 and compare it to the uh, and compare it to the damage table above. Oh, I see. Sorry. So yeah, it's a four plus to start with, then a five plus, then a six. If you roll the equivalent number, uh, the charging unit suffers DC D6 more wounds. So it's not quite as good as it used to be because they have to charge you and people will know not to charge you, uh, whereas it used to be if they were close enough. It would be nice if you could deep strike it in range and then affect units around you. But it's, it's a little bit of a protection. Again, it's almost to charge with chain fists and things like that. It hovers, so you, module, uh, you measure from the model's hull, not from the base. Floating Fortress. This model can move and fire heavy weapons without suffering hit rolls. So that's cool. It explodes, and then finally you've got the Eternity Gate, which is basically that um, units can t uh, deep strike through it, if you like. They can come on the board from the Tomb World through it, um, but also, yes, yeah, so they can transport through just instead of deep striking, which is nice, so you can defend the Monolith, but also the Monolith can get them to good positions by deep striking itself, so it can deep strike, and then the unit can deep strike out, so... That's pretty good. And also you can charge now. It doesn't say you can't charge when you come at the monolith. You can use the monolith to come down and charge a combat unit out of it. So that's pretty cool. So it's 381 points. It, it is a lot of points. Um, but it does survive so well now. Being toughness 8 with 20 wounds and 3 plus save. And having living metal. And as I said potentially investing in that spider sit behind it. That does get you near to 500 points. But... It would be nearly unkillable. It has got better firepower now. That particle whip is better. It can deep strike anywhere. No scatter. The Portal of Exile and the Eternity Gate are still there. Doesn't suffer any minuses to hit. And again, it has the fly rule. So again, the monolith's flying technically if it wants to. So it can also help deal with flyers. Um, especially with those flux arcs. Potentially. Well, and the particle whip because it's not a template anymore. So the particle whip could be really dangerous to flyers, even things like storm ravens. So I think the monolith's better value than it used to be. It's still not amazing value because obviously 381 points is a lot. So it hasn't suddenly become a must-have, but it. I think it's tactically plausible now to take a monolith. Whereas before, I think you took it. I mean, I, I take one, so not begrudging anyone taking one. You took one really because you had a really specific tactic in mind, or like me, you just loved it as a background piece. That's why I took it. Whereas now I can take it for the same reason, but I can also say I think this could be pretty good in the game. So that's cool. So on to the Annihilation Barge. 12 inch moves, so it's pretty quick. Weapon skill 6 plus, split skill 3 plus, strength 5, toughness 6, 8 wounds, 3 attacks, leash 10, 4 plus save. So defensively it's it's reasonably weak, toughness 6 and a 4 plus save, but it has got 8 wounds which isn't too bad. And it's pretty fast. It comes equipped with a Gauss Cannon and a Twin Tesla Destructor. The Twin Tesla Destructor is really good, we've already been through it in one of the earlier reviews. 24 inches, Assault 8, Strength 7, AP Dash, Damage 1. Uh, and each time you roll a 6 to hit you, do, you get 3 hits instead of 1. So obviously you actually end up averaging 8 or 9 hits even though you've only got 8 shots. And Strength 7 is good as well. I know the AP dash and damage one isn't brilliant, but that's a real high volume of shots, which is nice. Gauze Cannon is pretty good as well. Heavy 2, so it's only 2 shots, but you get Strength 5, AP minus 3, and D3 damage. It's nice. Or you can have the Tesla Cannon and just go for more shots. Um, so it's Strength 6 instead of Strength 7. Uh, but apart from that, and only 3 shots instead of 8, but apart from that, it's the same as the Tesla Destructor. Uh, it's got living metal, which is great. It explodes, and it's got quantum shielding, which and it's got the fly rule again, uh, just to go for quantum shielding again. So you roll a d6. If the result is less than the damage inflicted by the attack, it's ignored. So the more damage someone does to you, the better quantum shielding is, and it doesn't disappear anymore. It's there for all eight wounds. Um, can't speak highly enough of quantum shielding. I think it's amazing. So annihilation barge, 133. Tesla Destructor is free, Tesla Cannon is 13, and Gauze Cannon is 20. So I've got a Tesla Cannon on mine, so it will end up at 146. 
um, which is which is good. Um, I think that's good value. The amount of firepower it can pump out. It is pretty hard to kill, despite what I said earlier about the toughness six and the four per se. Because of living mail, because of quantum shielding, it's going to be pretty hard to take down. It's not expensive. 140 points for a vehicle now is pretty cheap. It used to be you got vindicators for about those points and things like that, and you were like, it's reasonably cheap, but it's it's still a decent chunk of points to pay for vehicles. But because vehicles have gone up, because they've become so much more survivable, 130, 140 points for a vehicle, especially one as good as the Nyash and Barge, is now pretty cheap pretty cheap. So we've got Doomsday Arc, so we are looking at uh, weapon skill 6 plus, strength and toughness 6, 14 wounds, leaves you 10, 4 plus save, and it goes down with its remaining wounds, movement 12, 8, 4, ballistic skill 3, 4, 5, attacks 3, D3, 1. So just to note, on the Annihilation Barge, it doesn't do that damage thing, so actually it stays effective for its whole life, so that's another really good thing about the Annihilation Barge. So the Doomsday Arc, it's got a lot of wounds. Again, it's got the toughness 6-4 plus save, which isn't amazing, but it's got 14 wounds, it's got living metal, and it's got quantum shielding. So again, pretty survivable, really. It's got the fly rule, and then it's weapons. You've got the gauze flare array, which is basically just five gauze flare shots either side, which is solid. Remain here for the Doomsday Cannon, though. So low power is 24 inches, heavy D3, strength 8, minus 2 AP, D3 damage. Which is solid, solid, depends on how many points it is, but it's okay. Or you can go on high power, which gives you 72 inch range, it's strength 10, minus 5 AP and D6 damage, so it certainly is high power. But if you do that, you have to remain stationary. Ah, so you actually, when targeting units of 10 or more, you actually get um, heavy D6 as well. So if you are firing the high power one, you get heavy D6 against large units as well, which is nice. To be fair, to, to remain stationary, you're going to fire that every time. Obviously, there's no negative. I thought it might uh, overheat like plasma, but I suppose these aren't Necrons. They are technological masters. So that's awesome, to be honest. That's that's really nasty. I mean, yes, you might get one shot, which would be a bit annoying, but you're going to average two. At strength 10, no saves allowed, D6 damage. That's pretty nasty. So the Doomsday Arc will set you back 203 points. Does the Doomsday Cannon cost? No. So that's okay. Gorse Flare Array? No. So it is 203 points completely. Um, yeah. Um, again, I, I think it's it, it's nicely balanced. Like the Annihilation Barge, which is maybe slightly cheap, and the Monolith, which is nicely balanced. It's it's pretty survivable, and, and the weapon is you know, pretty nasty. Um, you are paying 200 points, though, so I think that levels it out quite nicely. I think that's a pretty fair reflection of what you should be paying for it. But you might see a few more of them, which would be nice, because no one ever took Doomsday Arcs before, which is a bit of a shame, really. Okay, so the last unit in heavy support is a Transcendent Satan. Movement 8, Weapon Skill Ballistic Skill 2+, plus, Strength and Toughness 7, 8 Wounds, 4 Attacks, Legion 10, 4 per Save. Comes with Crackling Tendrils. For a melee weapon, strength of the user, which is 7, AP minus 4, D6 damage, so that's pretty nice. It has a 4 plus invulnerable save, it gets the powers of the Satan, uh, it knows 1, so that's a bit of a shame, it'd be nice if it had known more. Uh, writhing Worldscape, enemy units within 6 inches of model do not receive cover bonuses, it's okay. He's probably going to be charging them at that point anyway. He can fly, and when he dies, um, on a 4+, plus, he tears a hole in reality, and each unit within 3 inches suffers D3 mortal wounds. So, a bit of an emphasis to get him into the middle of the enemy army. Do a bit of extra damage. How much is he? Because he's not, he's not amazing. 232, but then he doesn't cost too many points. Yeah. I just think that 4+, plus save, or 4+, plus invulnerable save, bothers me a little bit. He is tough in 7 with 8 wounds, but considering you're only going to save 50% coming towards him... Yeah, I like him in combat. I mean, two's to hit with four attacks. Basically, no armor saves for anyone. Strength seven, d6 damage. If you pick your targets well, that could be nasty. But he's he's going to get shot up on the way in. But 230 points again, probably probably worth considering. So we're just going to do the Lords of War very quickly as well. You've got the Tesseract Vault, which is weapon skill six plus, strength eight, toughness seven, 28 wounds, three attacks, leisure ten, three plus save. Movement goes down 864, Blissical 345, Power to the Satan 321. 
Tesla Sphere is basically the Tesla Destructor but with only five shots, but you do obviously get four of them. Living Metal, if he dies on a four plus, every unit within 2d6 inches takes d6 more wounds, friend and foe, so don't let it blow up near you. Paris the Tan knows three powers, and it can use a number of powers equal to the amount you're allowed to use. So it, it's pretty good, considering it's got a five power and all the powers of the Tan. But how much is it? 500 points. I mean, 28 wounds does speak for itself. Yeah, the powers of the Tan are pretty good, so I think that's that's pretty solid. So I'm just speeding through these, because the, we don't see Lords of War too often. And then the Obelisk is weapon skill 6+, plus, strength and toughness 8, 24 wounds, 3 attacks, leisure 10, 3 plus save. Movement goes 864, ballistic skill 345, gravity, pulse 1826. It has a Tesla sphere again, living metal, explodes, uh, it can deep strike, and gravity pulse is basically in the shooting phase, raw dice for each enemy unit with the fly special rule that's within that gravity pulse range, and on 6 it suffers D3 more wounds. It's definitely not as good as the Tesla at Vault, the powers of this town are way better than that, because it's only on a 6 that they suffer more wounds, so it's a bit soft really. And it's 426 points. So if you're going to take one, take the Tesseract Vault. Definitely the better of the two. So that's actually um, the end of the Necron reviews. So that's the last video. I'm going to upload them all together so you should have been able to watch them. You know, one, two, three, four. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, my view on the Necrons are that they are very powerful still. The reanimation protocols rules amazing now. Just the fact you keep rolling on and on and on, but it's still on a 5 plus or a 4 plus with a Cryptek. So, unless you're destroying those units, um, I'm going to keep rolling, keep getting Necrons back. That is obviously the one massive piece of advice if you are playing against Necrons, destroy whole units, um, or at least cripple them to the point that if they get three or four Necrons back, you're not too worried. But they are going to keep doing it turn after turn. So, you've then got to destroy that unit of four, really, because otherwise they're going to start getting back to full strength. I think the vehicles are good and the flyers are good, very powerful, very hard to kill. The Netcon infantry is very good. Some of the units that we've already seen before are going to be good. Leech Guard and Tri Praetorians, for instance. Um, some of the vehicles you don't really see, like Monoliths, Doomsday Arcs, are pretty good. Um, I think the only things that have really taken a hit are Wraiths and Tomb Blades. Tomb Blades are just a lot more expensive. They're still as useful. They're just 40 odd points now per biker, which is quite expensive, really. So I'm not saying if you've got them, don't use them. Um, definitely give them a go, see how they do. Um, but just the fact that 10 of them are going to be 400 points is is a bit too much for me. And the Wraiths, just because they've lost their punch, they're just as survivable as they were. Uh, whip cores are still cool, um, making sure you always strike even if you die before you get the chance. Just the fact that they've lost rending and in return they've basically got minus one AP on their weapons, which isn't obviously nowhere near as good as rending really. So they're not quite as good, but they're costing the same points roughly as well. But again, certainly with keeping your army, I'd still definitely run them. I just I just, just you just can't expect quite as much out of them, that's all. And you can build an army without them, without someone going, why haven't you got race in your army? Uh, which is a lot of what you get at the moment. So Necron's still really good. Uh, still really competitive, but the points seem about balanced, which is really nice to see. I haven't seen many things where I thought, wow, they're super cheap for what they do. And there's a few characters to play there. Um, you know, a few different characters with different backgrounds, different things you could base your army around fluff-wise, but also with different abilities as well. Uh, the one's highlights probably Imitech. Um, he's the most expensive, but he is quite a boss, so it's certainly worth looking at. So that's the Necron review. I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. I'll keep doing more reviews, so tune in for them. Um, in the meantime, please comment, like, and subscribe. Comment on the video. Comment on the Necrons. Uh, what do you think of them? Like the video and please subscribe so um, I know that you guys are enjoying the videos and I can do more videos in the future. But in the meantime, guys, I will talk to you all soon.